All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming to the session, uh, everybody who's here at Tech Bash, and uh, of course, everybody who's watching on Twitch, too. I appreciate you joining me. My name is Jonathan Tower. I go by Jay. Uh, we're going to talk about the dependency injection framework that's built into ASP.NET Core today. Uh, a little bit about me, the requisite introductory slide. Uh, I do go by Jay. It's short for Jonathan. I'm a partner and principal consultant and founding member of a, a software consulting company. Uh, we're all over the US. I'm in Michigan. Uh, if you or your company is ever looking to do anything with .NET Core or uh, .NET in general, and you're looking for some help with that, uh, please feel free to take this contact information that you see up here and contact me. Uh, we'd be happy to help you out. All the slides and stuff uh, that we, we look at today are going to be here on my GitHub, and I will have this link again at the end. If you're right now feverishly trying to get out your phone to take a picture of that, uh, we'll have that again at the end so you can see. So this is what I want to talk about with you today. Uh, first of all, I want to just make sure everyone's on the same page about dependency injection and inversion of control in general. Uh, so we're just going to have a quick kind of recap of those things just to make sure everyone is coming from the same background of understanding with that so that you can see that when we start looking at ASP.NET Core specifically and its DI framework, you can start seeing how it accomplishes some of those goals of inversion of control and a dependency injection framework in general. Uh, we're going to look at uh, a lot of specifics you can see there about the DI framework in ASP.NET Core. Also going to show you a real world example so you can kind of get a feel for how it's working uh, when all the pieces kind of fit together. And then the last thing I want to show you is there's some third party DI frameworks that exist out there. Anybody using any of those already? Yeah, what, shout it out. What are your, what ones are you using? Okay, yep, yep. I heard a lot of the popular ones out there. So we're going to talk about some of those, uh, not all of them obviously because of time, but uh, hopefully one of the ones that you're using will be in there and you can see how you can actually use a third party DI framework in ASP.NET Core as well. Uh, but first, before we get started, something I like to do at all my sessions, I do this as a way to give back. Obviously, us speakers are not uh, paid for this. This is something we do as volunteers. I do it because uh, there's been a lot of people who fed into my career over the years, either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or other speakers at conferences that have given me a lot of great stuff. Um, and so I just do this as a way to kind of pay it forward. Uh, but in a sense, we all are kind of lucky because we're in an industry where we're in demand. We're all paid pretty well. Um, we have some disposable income. There's about a billion people in the world that don't have clean water, and that causes all kinds of problems, health problems, poverty. And uh, so this is an issue that's close to my heart. If during this talk you guys go to this bit.ly link right here, and that's uh, tb-di for uh, techbash-di, if you go to that bit.ly link, I promise not to be mad that you're on your phone during my talk. Um, and give some money, this little progress bar right here will actually light up if you guys move up towards the $75 goal. Uh, that's maybe a dollar or two per person in here, so that's not too much. And I'll put my money where my mouth is. If you guys hit 75 bucks during my talk, I also will do that. Uh, I'll extend that offer, obviously, out to our Twitch watchers as well. All right, uh, so a quick recap of DI and IOC. What is dependency injection? Uh, well, it's just a way to do inversion of control. All right, you say, great, now I can leave now, right? Now I understand it. Thank you. Well, so you're probably wondering, Jay, what is inversion of control? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about that first. So let's look at this example right here. Uh, you can see we've got a text editor class. So you can imagine this class is responsible for some sort of a text editor, like a notepad type of a, a UI or something like that. Uh, and it's got a dependency on this spell checker class. And it's using that to do spell checking. So when you create a text editor, it has to create its own spell checker right here. So right here, you can see that the control for where this dependency is being created is happening inside the constructor for this class. So these are very tightly coupled together now, the spell checker class and the text editor class. If I wanted to change the text editor class, I would have to recompile uh, to use a different spell checker, I mean, I'd have to recompile my code that uses the text editor class with a new spell checker in it. Uh, furthermore, I'd have to actually go edit the code to actually change the name of that class to point to some other spell checker, right? 
Now when I invert the control, all it really means is what we're doing over here on the right. It means that the control of where a dependency comes from is taken up. It's instead of coming from below the class, it's coming from above the class. It's calling from the, the coming from the calling code right here. So now the spell checker is actually created outside and passed into the constructor to the text editor. And you can see here the text editor now does not have a relationship to the spell checker implementation. It has a relationship to the spell checker interface. So now anything that implements that spell checker interface could be passed in there at runtime. And this code doesn't have to be recompiled even if new spell checkers come along in the future. Uh, those can be passed in and this code will just continue to work with those as long as they implement that spell checker interface. So that's inversion of control in a nutshell. Uh, so what's the big deal with inversion of control? Um, well, my friend Steve Smith, if you're familiar with him, our Dallas on Twitter, he says that new is glue. So when you use that new keyword to create an instance, uh, in our last example, you were do we were doing it to create an instance of the spell checker. As soon as we did that, we really kind of glued together that spell checker implementation to our text editor implementation. Now if we want to test our text editor without the spell checker being involved, we can't really do that. They're glued together too tightly. If we want to change the implementation at runtime, we can't really do that either because of that new is glue problem. The other reason is that uh, if you're really doing well, uh, poor, uh, lightly coupled or loosely coupled code, um, you're actually going to be writing it in such a way that your classes depend on the services that they need, not on the specific implementations of those services. So what we really saw causing that to happen in that inversion of control example was relying on the interface I spell checker instead of the spell checker implementation. All right, so think of it this way. Uh, when you have a dependency on, an on a specific implementation of one of your dependencies, you've kind of hard-coded that relationship. When in object-oriented, you use service contracts, which we call interfaces in object-oriented, now you're inverting that control and making sure that the code isn't quite so tightly coupled. So you might already be thinking, okay, Jay, that's great, but this is gonna create some pretty ugly code. My code doesn't just have one dependency for one class. Mine has a whole tree of dependencies like this example here, maybe even more complicated than this, right? So imagine this scenario where A relies on B, which in turn relies on C and D, and then D relies on E and F. Not an uncommon scenario in our code probably, right? For that level of a tree of dependencies. Well, if I had to do this right here to create an F and then an E and then pass them into a D and then create a C and pass the C and D into a B and so on, just so I could create an A and use it, that's gonna be a real pain, right? So obviously inversion of control does a nice job of decoupling, but it doesn't do a nice job as far as my code and the extra uh, Structure type work that I have to do. Or, you know, even if I consolidate this, all this code up here into one line, which I can do, it still isn't really much better. That's not a very readable line of code. It's like every other word is the word new, right? Uh, so it's kind of hard to tell what's going on there. Just so that I can call this method here. So there's got to be a better way to do that, right? Of course, there is. And that's where dependency injection comes in. So now we've talked about inversion of control and the benefits that that gets us. Dependency injection really is just a way that we do inversion of control. And really the way that it typically works is there'll be one object or one class that will uh, have a long lifetime, usually the lifetime of the application, or if it's a web application, maybe the lifetime of the request. And we'll create instances of our classes for us and automatically inject these dependencies. So basically, allowing us to do all this newing without ever having to do any of this newing. It does all of that for us. So that's the idea of a dependency injection framework. It's just a class or a series of classes that's doing that work for us to make inversion of control less messy. Uh, it's usually done by some sort of a framework. Today we're talking about ASP.NET Core and it's got a built-in framework for doing DI. Uh, so we'll get into that in just a little bit uh, in just a second here. Uh, but first, a few terms that if you do any kind of more digging into inversion of control or dependency injection, you're gonna see these terms, and I just wanted to kind of give you a quick definition of them so you know how to think about these. Uh, the first one is service, and so we talked about this just a second ago, and we kind of said your code should rely on the services it needs, not on the implementation. 
And we said, really, a service in object-oriented programming means an interface. So that's really what we're talking about here. A service is just a, uh, a piece of code that is depended on, or a dependency. And then a client would be anything that's consuming that service, just like you know, a browser is considered a client for a, a REST service or a web, a web server. Um, a client, in this case, is going to be any code uh, or any class that is dependent on some other class. And then finally, the injector, that's kind of the magic, the, the framework that you're using that actually does that injection magic for you, uh, all of the newing that we were just talking about. All right, now let's look at an example of dependency injection at work here. So I've got this I now logger class, that, or I'm sorry, interface, that just has a log method that returns void. So it's a real simple interface. And then I've created an, uh, in, an implementation of it called console now logger. And you can see inside of the log method, I'm just logging the datetime.now to the console. Okay? So you could imagine I could create another one of those that would be like a standard output logger, or I could create like a database logger, or file system logger, or something like that, right? Those would all be different implementations of this interface right here. Uh, but they would all be logging in different ways or to, to different destinations. Uh, now imagine I've got some sort of a generic dependency injection library here. Uh, and this isn't really the syntax, the exact syntax that any of them use, but I'm just showing you in general what it might look like. So you might say I want to map the iNowLogger interface to the console now logger implementation. And that is basically how all of them work. Uh, the syntaxes are always a little different in all the different frameworks. But that right there is going to say, whenever you see an I now logger, cre excuse me, create or, or give me an existing console now logger. So then the code that we're actually using that in here is called some class. See, it's got a private I now logger field in it. And then in its constructor, it's asking for an I now logger to be passed in, and it's storing that in the field. Now for the lifetime of that class, it's got a I now logger implementation of some kind available to it that it can use in any of its methods to do you know, all of this very useful logging of the date time to the console. Uh, so that's the basic idea of dependency injection. And to get that magic to work, uh, obviously this right here is the hard part. I need something that will actually create this class for me. Uh, it, has to, it has to either create this class or this class has to be created from another class that it's a dependency for, or somewhere in that tree of dependencies. Uh, but somewhere at the very top, I have to have something that's creating my dependency for me. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. So what are the benefits of using DI? Well, the big one is it lowers the coupling between your modules. We talked about that at the beginning. If you're familiar with the solid principles at all, it kind of hits on a couple of those. The big one, of course, is number uh, five here, which is the dependency inversion principle. But it also kind of helps out with the single responsibility principle, which says that a class should only have one responsibility. Um, it should be an expert on that, and it shouldn't have to know anything about the inner workings of anything else. And in that case, uh, take the example of the editor class we were just looking at with the spell checker. If the editor has to create an instance of the spell checker, well, it doesn't necessarily know what's happening inside the spell checker. But now it has to know which spell checker to create. And so in a sense, it started to kind of blur the line between those two classes a little bit more than we want to uh, for the single resp responsibility principle. Another really important one uh, that maybe some of you have run into already, it makes your code more testable. Uh, it's frequently something you want to do when you're unit testing is you want to switch out what things you're swapping in as dependencies. So you might have, say, for example, a data access layer. And if you're doing unit testing, you want your unit tests to be repeatable. So you don't want to have to have your database in a certain state to be able to run your unit test successfully. Uh, and so to do that, you'd use probably some sort of mocking to create a fake version of your data access layer that would return some sort of um, some known entities from your database. That would be perfect edge cases for your unit test. You can do all of that much more easily when you've set your code up in this slightly and loosely coupled way uh, using dependency injection and actually swap out your implementations at runtime. The other one is just swappable modularity. Uh, an example I often run into is, uh, for example, in uh, 
let's say you've got a class that sends emails out for your application, and when you're running in your development environment or your test environment, you want to do something different. Now you could have some code that just a big if block that says, if it's development environment, do this, otherwise do that. There's always a chance that things could get messed up there. You could also just implement that as two different implementations of your email sending class, uh, email sending interface, okay? Uh, one of them that actually sends the email and one of them that maybe sends it to a test email address or drops it to a folder somewhere so you can test it, right? So now we've actually got modularity where I can say, I want the email sender to work differently in these different situations. All right, so that's the everybody on the same page part. So hopefully now we all feel a little more comfortable what we're talking about. So let's talk about DI in ASP.NET specifically. First thing you need to know about uh, DI anywhere in ASP.NET 4 is the lifetime or the scope that you create for your different, uh, for your different services. So in ASP.NET Core, there's three options for that. Keeps it pretty simple. The first one is called Singleton. As the name suggests, that allows you to create just a single instance for the lifetime of your application. So if you've got something like, uh, let's say you're, uh, you're putting in some expired tokens to a list somewhere in memory to make sure that an expired token isn't able to come back into your application and, and access things, even though its expiration date hasn't passed, something like that. You want that to be like a static list that's available to all code that wants to get that list of expired tokens. You can do that very easily by creating a service uh, that is dependency injected, injected as a singleton. Now, everywhere that that's asked for, there's just going to be that one instance of it running. Scoped, a really important one for web applications. This allows you to scope it to the HTTP request. So if you imagine basically from the moment the request comes in to the moment the response finishes going out, that is the scope of a HTTP context class. And that is the, uh, what scoped means. So a great use for this one, I find, is maybe like your data access component. Uh, it might create an instance of a connection beneath, underneath of itself, a database connection or something like that. Uh, and you only want to have one of those throughout the whole request response cycle. Well, you can easily do that by just making it a scoped uh, lifetime. And then the last choice is transient, which, as the name suggests, is uh, you know, created and destroyed all the time, which basically means anywhere that you are asking for one of these, you're always going to get a new one. Yes, we had a question? Right, so the question is about the difference between how often the sing uh, singleton and scoped get get called the constructors on those dependencies, right? And the answer to that is basically, so for, for singleton, that's once for the lifetime of the application. So those are things that you want to live across multiple requests. Things that you might have created as static variables in the past web application. Uh, and then the other one, that's per request. So scoped is per request. Does that make sense? These apply to the creation of your dependencies. Yep. Uh, your dependency classes. Yeah, I think you just came in, right? So you missed the beginning. So the beginning, we were, that's fine. We were just talking about uh, dependency injection. Yeah, yeah. So these are the, the lifetimes of your dependency classes that you're injecting into other classes. Yep. All right, so in ASP.NET Core, uh, you've got two, two methods in the startup class. You've got the uh, configure services, and then you've got the configure method. Is, who, show of hands, who's using ASP.NET and is already kind of familiar with these? Okay, we've got over half of the crowd. Okay, so I won't go into a lot of detail. You already know about these, but um, configure services, we're not, uh, but we're going to talk more about that one because that is where you configure your dependency injection. As the name kind of suggests, uh, we said services is a sort of a keyword that represents dependency injection, dependencies. Uh, so that's what's happening in that method. We'll talk about that a little bit more. The configure method is another one there, and that's for the HTTP pipeline. That's where you configure your middleware in ASP.NET Core. That one is not important for dependency injection, so uh, we can kind of ignore that right now in our example. 
So here's a sample startup class, a real simple one. I've got the figure method just kind of collapsed here because it's not super important for us. And you can see here in configure services, I'm basically saying I want to add two services. I'm making them both transient, and I'm doing that by using the add transient method of this services collection. But before I go into that, I actually want to show you one other thing. Notice that the configure services method is actually getting a dependency injected into it too. So even if you are not using dependency injection in your code, ASP.NET Core is already using dependency injection, which is part of why it already has this framework built into it, uh, because the way it works itself internally is doing dependency injection. So when you actually add MVC to your project and configure it in your startup here, one of the things that you may or may not realize that you're actually doing is you're calling a method that's actually doing a bunch of these add methods, scoped and transient mostly, uh, to create different relationships for interfaces and classes that are part of the ASP.NET Core uh, framework. Okay, so all that stuff has already happened, and now we're just configuring our own stuff. And because that stuff has already happened, when I say I want an iService collection called services injected into this method, the framework is going to say I know what to put there, and it's going to give me a concrete implementation of that. And now I can actually call add transient and map my own uh, so in this case, I'm mapping an email sender and an SMS sending class to a specific implementation. And because I'm adding a transient, every time I ask for one of those in another class, it's going to be a new instance. Okay? All right, so there's, I, I mentioned before that you have to have this uh, dependency injection framework do some magic for you, kind of at the top level of your dependency tree. There's basically three entry points to your code in an ASP.NET MVC application uh, that kind of starts the implement or starts the execution of your code. The first and most obvious one of those is controllers. So let's look at how you would add dependency injection to a controller. Okay, so it's this easy. I create a field that is of the interface type, so I have somewhere to hold it inside the instance of the controller. Then I I make that same type a parameter to my constructor. Now I have to have wired this I some dependency up. I have to have added it to the services collection uh, to give it a specific type to create uh, during my startup. But now when this class gets created by the framework, this is going to get created for me automatically to respond to a request that's going to the home controller. It's going to say, oh, I know what to inject for that some depend I some dependency interface. It's going to send me a concrete class, which I can then capture into this field. And now in any of my uh, action methods inside my controller, I can now use that dependency as that interface. Make sense? All right. So the second entry point that I could have into my code, and this is a little less common. Uh, anybody written any custom middleware? or is it Few people, yep, so that's definitely less common. I'm guessing if I asked who had written a controller before that I would have seen almost all the hands. Uh, so middleware is basically, uh, you can think of it as kind of a pipe, part of the pipeline uh, when requests come in. MVC is actually kind of the last thing in that pipeline. So when your controller gets executed, that request has already gone through a bunch of things in the pipeline that have decided not to respond to it. And then it finally makes it down to a controller. Uh, some of the other things that could respond to requests are, for example, you've probably seen the static file middleware uh, in ASP.NET 4. Uh, for example, if it finds a file that matches the request, like a JPEG or something like that, that's on your file system, that's going to actually respond before a, a controller is actually hit. So if you're writing your own custom middleware, maybe you're doing some authentication or maybe you're doing something else uh, custom, maybe exception handling or something, if you write middleware, you also need to be able to inject into that. And that actually looks exactly the same as it does in the controller. All we do is we add the dependency interface to the constructor and capture it into a field like we did before. And now in the invoke method for this middleware, I can use that dependency. So just like the controller, middleware is created and destroyed for each request. So controllers and middleware, I don't have to worry about this dependency living too long, it's going to basically respond to this one request and then they're going to, it's going to be destroyed. Is there a question or fetch? Yeah. 
for runtime parameters. Right, so uh, the, the question is basically how do you do runtime dependent uh, parameters with your dependencies? Kind of depends on what the, what the runtime parameter is. So let's assume it's a configuration setting. Your dependencies can read configuration settings themselves. Um, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, uh, if that's the type of situ situation that covers your question. Um, there's an I options interface that's built into the framework that we're gonna just talk about in a second. That kinda, okay, okay, cool. So let me know after we talk about that if that doesn't answer your question. Uh, and then the last place that your code could have sort of an entry point that dependency injection might need to be triggered is in Razor, in your actual views. And uh, this probably isn't the best place to do it. I find usually that if you're doing it here, there's probably some sort of an architectural design problem with your code. But uh, if you do need to do it in here for some reason, maybe you've, got, uh, maybe you've got a Razor helper of some kind that you want to inject, this is a good place, a good situation to do something like that. There's a very simple new keyword in Razor. It's just at sign with inject. Here's the interface you want to inject and the name that you want to use for it inside of your Razor file here. Now this is being, in, this interface will be injected or the concrete implementation of this interface will be injected. I can use that anywhere in my code. Any of the members of that class can be accessed. Okay, so those are kind of the three different places, controllers, middleware, and views that I could actually receive uh, or start out the dependency injection tree. Yeah, so that's the, the fourth place. Uh, so the question is about action filters, and yes, act, it works in action filters the same way. You just do it in the constructor, capture it into a field, and then you can use it in the, I think it's called invoke method in there as well. Yep, good question. All right, so, I mentioned before the DI framework that's built into ASP.NET Core is actually uh, what ASP.NET Core uses for all of its own internal dependencies to make your MVC application run or, or web API application run. Here's a bunch of the many, many uh, interfaces that are going on under the scenes that you may or may not know about. I've kind of highlighted a few that I want to call out, uh, call your attention to. They're ones that are actually very useful. You may want to grab one of these in one of your own constructors to uh, get some information that you need in your application. So the first one is the hosting environment interface. That one's got things like uh, what uh, environment variables are set, configuration settings, uh, directory structure, things like that. So if you're looking for that type of information, that's a good interface that's built into to ASP.NET Core that you can use. Uh, the iLogger of T and the iLogger factory, these next two are very closely related to each other. So the iLogger factory is kind of an interesting one. Uh, any logger that you create in ASP.NET Core has to have a category. Uh, so if you think about like um, the old Windows event viewer, uh, those Windows events, they always have an application and category, right? I think this idea has kind of moved forward here into ASP.NET Core, that every log item has to have some sort of a category. And you can create your own with the iLogger factory and then you pass it a string basically, uh, what you want the, um, what you want the uh, category to be. Or you can use the iLogger of T, and then the type that you give that, the T type, is usually typically a controller or the class that this logger is running inside of. And that will actually use the name of the class as the category. So that's the most common one you see. You'll often see, uh, let's say the home controller will inject an iLogger of home controller. That will make everything that the home controller logs log under the home controller category. That way you can kind of figure out where things are coming from. Uh, the next one, the application builder factory. This is one where when you're actually configuring your pipeline, uh, this is the one you're actually using. So in that configure method that we kind of skipped talking about, that's what's actually going on in there. Uh, the iHttp context factory, this is a really important one. You want to get anything about the HTTP request or response, this is the one that you need to do. If you're in some code somewhere, if you're in a controller, you already have an HTTP context from the base class, the base controller class. But there's some other places you might be uh, writing a helper method that's way down the tree of dependencies that uh, does not have access to the context and it needs to get a header or it needs to get something from the request or influence the response in some way. Well, you can access all that stuff just by injecting this interface here. 
Uh, now to this gentleman's question about configuring things. So uh, if you haven't looked into this at all, the uh, ASP.NET Core has this very robust configuration framework that's built into it. And one of the ways you can configure things is uh, using dependency injection. You can actually create a section of your configuration files that is uh, mapped to a certain type in your, in your code. You might have a type that has four or five settings in it, and those four or five settings load from a JSON file with similar names. You can actually inject that type right here, that type that potentially contains all of your configuration settings. And if you inject an I options of that type, then you'll get all of your configuration settings inside a dependency where you want. So that's kind of how you access those. Does that kind of address your question? Yes. Uh, the last two I just wanted to mention real quick, uh, the startup, the iStartup interface. This is what kind of configures all of the startup stuff for your class, and then the application lifetime interface. If you ever do need to uh, handle events like the application being started or stopped, those events are actually accessible by injecting this interface and then doing some event handlers. Okay, now we've kind of covered the basics. Let's all bring it, let's bring it all together with a quick demo here. All right, is that code big enough for everyone to see okay? All right, getting, getting big nods in the back, so that tells me that we must. All right, so I've created this class. Let me show you the startup first though. In my startup here, I've got a method that I'm calling uh, during the configure services called configure ASP net D DI. Uh, similar to the examples we've looked at before, I'm adding a couple of services. But instead of adding them as transient like we looked at before, now I'm adding them as a singleton and as a scoped. So just to recap, first one will be one instance for the lifetime of the application. Second one, will be scoped to request. So that'll be created new every time you have a new request. All right, now let's actually look at those. Uh, the first one is the request ID factory, and the second one is the request ID. So let's go look at the implementation of those. Okay, so the request ID factory just has a simple method. It returns a string. Uh, the method is called make request ID. Okay, now if we look at my implementation for that, the request ID factory class here. First of all, we can see it's got a private integer member called request ID. And then we can see the implementation for that make request ID method. And basically what it's doing here, although it's doing it in a way that might not look super familiar, it's taking that request ID, incrementing it by one and setting the value back and then converting it to a string. Now the reason I'm not just doing that with a plus plus syntax is because plus plus is actually not thread safe. And this particular code here could be run by multiple different threads uh, during its lifetime, and so I need it to be thread safe and make sure that that uh, request ID isn't being accessed by two different threads at the same time. So to do that, I've used the interlocked version of the increment method, which is just going to make sure it's thread safe for me. And then convert that integer to a string. Now note that this integer is not a static integer. This is kind of how we would do it without dependencies, right? If we were creating a class, we'd create a static class, and it would have a static integer in it, and that would be the request ID, and we'd implement that. This is not a static method, and the reason it doesn't have to be, because if we look here, this is being added as scoped, right? So that's actually going to get created on each instance. The new, I'm sorry, I was showing you the wrong one. This is being added as a singleton, the request ID factory. The request ID factory is going to be created once for the lifetime of the application. The first time something asks for it, it'll be created. After that, it'll be the same instance over and over. Now because of that, that instance will hold on to that request ID integer field for me. And it'll never need to be created new or never need to be a static member because that's going to live for the whole lifetime of the application. Okay, so that's the request ID factory. Now let's look at the actual request ID method. So here, the request ID method has a constructor that says, I depend on the request ID factory interface. So that's going to be injected in here. And that, just like we saw in everywhere else, that's going to be captured into a field to be reused. 
And then when I use the one method that is on this interface, which is the ID of type string, that method is going to just return the request ID that was just generated. Does that make sense? So we call the request ID class. It creates its own dependency, which is the request ID factory, asks it to make a new request ID, returns that request ID as a string. This one, if you remember, is scoped. So that means this one is gonna get recreated every single request response cycle. So this one is not going to live for the lifetime of the application, which means that it's going to keep getting recreated every time I, I do a refresh in my browser. But it's not going to, it's, uh, it's not going to reset that integer to zero because that integer is inside of the request ID factory, which is its dependency, which has a different scope, which is the lifetime of the application. So just to kind of pull that all together, let's actually run this. And I've got a simple controller method here that's just calling this request ID service, injecting it. And so if we open up our browser here, of course it compiles slower when you're watching. Okay, so there you can see it's request ID one. And if I refresh that, it's just gonna go up by one each time, right? Now what if somebody else makes a request? Someone else makes a request, it's gonna also go up by one each time. What happens if we go back to the first tab? It was on seven over there, so of course now it goes up to eight. Right, so that request ID factory service is keeping track of that request ID for me because it's scoped to the lifetime of this application. Now of course if I restart the application, that's gonna reset to zero and my count is gonna go up from zero again. Any questions about that sample? Is that kinda Yeah, so if you're worried about the state of an object living too long, application, uh, something that could get messed up over time and not work correctly, then you don't want it to be a single, obviously. Um, if you have something like this request ID that you do want to live throughout the application as one single instance, then, then you do want a single. Yep, good question. Other questions about that? Yes, in the back. Yes, I did not ever call new, that's right. New is glue, so that would be bad if I did that, right? Other questions, or should, can we move on? I just wanna make sure that you kinda of understand that that was the pulled all together moment. So if it's not feeling pulled all together, happy to answer questions. All right, cool. Let's talk a little bit about third party DI frameworks. I heard a bunch of them that you guys shouted out a minute ago. Anybody using Autofac? All right, those are my people right there. Uh, anyone using uh, Ninject? Okay. Anyone using Structure Map? Okay. I feel like we're we're gonna cover all of them. Uh, Unity. Person willing to admit that? Okay. All right. So let's start with Autofac. Which of the third-party ones is probably my favorite? I, I've actually probably used Ninject the most, but Autofac is my favorite. Let's go look at my startup class again. This time I'm going to go right into the configure method, a configure services method, I mean. Let's collapse some of these things. We've got a lot of code here. Okay. So down here in my configure services method, uh, instead of calling the configure ASP net DI, I'm going to call the autofac DI method. So let's look at what's going on in there. So I've brought in an autofac NuGet package, of course, and autofac uses this container builder as kind of its entry point for configuration. So I'm creating a new configure uh, container builder, then I'm telling that builder I want to register a type. Now, Here's kind of an interesting difference about Autofac. All the other frameworks go interface, then concrete implementation. And Autofac actually prefers register type, this is the concrete implementation, as, and this is the interface. And then the other thing that I kind of like about Autofac is that 
a lot of the frameworks, somewhere in that first part of the statement right there, would be the scope or the lifetime uh, management. But Autofac actually does it here as kind of a, a uh, an extension onto the, the end of this statement. So I can keep chaining these statements long in Autofac and do some pretty powerful stuff. This first line is basically creating a, a singleton instance of the request ID factory, just like we did before in the built-in DI framework. And then this one right here, you see it doesn't have a type at the end of the statement, and that's because the default in Autofac is scoped to the request. So this is going to create the request ID relationship scoped uh, one instance per request. And then there's a little bit of stuff I have to do to get that builder uh, into the shape that it needs to be to be passed back to the application, uh, to the ASP.NET Core application. Uh, but it's just a few lines of code to get Autofac to work here in ASP.NET Core. And one of the cool things about the way they wrote this is they do have their own DI framework, but they also recognize that a lot of us come to the table with our own DI framework that we prefer to use already, maybe one that we're already using in a project. We want to be able to continue to use in ASP.NET Core projects. And for that reason, uh, we actually, they, actually wrote the, uh, they actually wrote the DI framework in a way that it was very easy to hook into. So all of these frameworks, with, tip with one exception that I'll show you today, uh, all of these frameworks have very small amount of code that you actually have to write to be able to hook that DI framework in and use it at the very low level. So just to test this out again, see here if I refresh it, still a request implement for me. Uh, but now it's using Autofac to do that instead. All right, so structure map, map is my next one. Who are my structure, structure map people? Okay, I've got a few of you in the audience. So this syntax will look more familiar to you guys. I go to the structure map method. So structure map uses this container class as, uh, as its root for configuration. Then in its configure method, we get the configure object, and that configure object is kind of what we chain all of our configurations to. And so you can see this syntax is somewhat similar to what we just saw in Autofac, uh, where chaining on the singleton and scoped at the end. Uh, this flips the order back to the kind of more default order, which is interface listed first four here, and then implementation listed second here. All right, again, a couple lines of code to get that into the shape that it needs to be for ASP.NET Core application. But not too bad, right? Not bad, a couple lines of code and a NuGet command. Now I'm using structure map instead of Autofac or ASP.NET Core DI. And just to prove that it works here, I'll show you that the request ID still increments for us. All right, so now I think my last example is Ninject. I need to give you some caveats here before I actually go into this one. Is anybody already uh, aware of the situation with Ninject? ASP.NET Core, okay. Inject isn't, doesn't have any specific plans to be uh, brought up to speed at this point. I've been giving this talk for I think a year and a half on and off, and I keep updating it for things that happen in ASP.NET Core, uh, and every time I update it, I check again to make sure that this is still true, that Inject uh, is not really possible to do in ASP.NET Core. And I shouldn't say it's not possible, it is possible, it's just a huge pain in the butt. So. Uh, if you do need to do it, like if you have a project that's already using Inject and it's so embedded in your project, you just can't get rid of it, you're going to want to go to this GitHub repo right here called Missing Core DI Extension. Uh, basically, every DI framework that you've probably ever heard of, somebody has contributed to this project here some sort of a hook to get it at least somewhat working in ASP.NET Core. Uh, some cases better than others, but basically if the library uh, producers, if the contributors to the library itself have not bothered to fix it for ASP.NET Core, then you'll find a lot of times the community has done it here. So you can bring in this uh, as a NuGet package and actually uh, fix a lot of these things. So this code is a little bit old, but let me show you it's real nasty <laughs> what we had to do to bring it into Ninject. 
Okay, so Ninjax starts around line 87 here. It ends around line 125. Then I also had to bring in all of these classes here, which are from that, that missing DI extensions repository. And with all of that code and all of this code, I was able to get Ninjax mostly working ASP.NET Core. I could not get it working from views. I could get it working from controllers and middleware and filters and stuff like that. Um, so just a word of warning to you, if you are in Inject world and you want to bring it into core, it seems like it's possible. It is definitely a pain, definitely not as smooth and easy as all the other ones basically are now. Question. Sure. Some of the third-party DI frameworks? Yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, what are some of the benefits of using one of the third-party libraries over using the built-in one? And I think the main thing is you can do more complex configurations. But really, I've showed you all of your options that are available to you for DI. As far as lifetime, as far as mappings go, so you can map one thing to one thing. You can map it with one scope. You can do a lot of really fancy stuff. For example, in Autofact, you can say, if the class is being injected into a de as a dependency somewhere in a tree beneath this type, so if I go up the tree, I find type XYZ, uh, inject this one. Otherwise, inject this other one. You can do really fancy stuff with some of the third party ones that the, the basic one does not do. So it just gives you more control. Yes, question. Right. <clears throat> yeah, so the question is, um, uh, where does the magic happen, basically, or what's kind of, give, give me a peek behind the curtain, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> basically, uh, ASP.NET Core, uh, MVC, and, and Web API is a perfect framework to do DI in, and the reason is because your code never is, create, is instantiated by itself. Your code almost never, an ASP.NET application, runs without some framework code having run first, and creating and calling it, right? So you never have to create an instance of your controller. You never have to create your own instance of your middleware. That always just happens in the framework. Because of that, you know, a request into, let's say, IIS or wherever you're hosting your ASP.NET Core application, uh, that triggers uh, .NET and to run, or Kestrel to run, which triggers .NET to run. And uh, .NET is what actually causes your application to run. As that's running, the ASP.NET framework does a whole bunch of things, and then it eventually creates an instance controller for you. When it's doing that, that's when the magic happens, where it says, okay, I need to look at this constructor and inject classes here. And of course, the problem comes when, if you are trying to, say, retrofit uh, an existing application that doesn't have dependency injection anywhere in it, you're trying to do it. Um, has anyone tried to do that with async await? Like, uh, Oh, hey, down at the database access layer, we're going to start adding async methods, changing all our methods to be async. All of a sudden, you discover that, well, now everything calling that has to be async. And everything calling those has to be async. And pretty soon, you've gone to every method in your whole application and changed them all to async, right? Uh, it's really a lot the same with DI. Once you start changing your application to DI, everything that calls that in that whole dependency, all the way up to the very top of the request, has to be or somehow hacked to allow you to do that. So does that answer the question? Other questions? Yes, in the blue here. Uh, in this example, uh, it's an older one, I can't remember. Uh, probably been, the syntax been updated recently. What's that? They switched to Lamar. Yeah, this is probably an older version here. One three. Yeah, so that's pretty old, right? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you have an eye disposable, I believe every framework has some sort of way of handling eye disposable that's fairly consistent internally, but they're not necessarily all the same as each other. So if you are using one of these and you're not already familiar with it, you're going to want to uh, look at the documentation for that framework and make sure you know what's happening to your eye disposable that you're using correctly. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So this framework was built as part of ASP.NET. Uh, so if you're using it outside of ASP.NET, uh, I believe in version uh, .NET Core 2.0, I think it was, uh, those got moved over to .NET Core in general. You can use it like in a console application. For if you want to use it somewhere else, maybe somewhat limited. There's another reason to your question earlier, sir. Uh, about why you might want to use a third-party one. If, you're use, if you've got a library that's doing dependency injection for autofac or inject or something like that, then you want to be able to use it in your Xamarin app and your web application all over the place, then you might want to use a third-party one. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Yeah, so he's just saying that it does work in a console app. Yes. Um, you're asking how you can configure the, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can show you afterwards if you're interested, yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah, so the question is, is there a way to kind of automate that? And yes, there is. Uh, you can use reflection. .NET Core since 1.1 has had reflection back. So you can use that. I usually do that. Uh, you know, 99% of the time, like if I have a repository class, I want it to be, I want it to have the same lifetime as every other repository class in the application. So I'll just, I'll set up some code that basically says, a loop over all of the classes that have this type and implement an interface that has a name repository, where the class also has a name repository. That is custom, yep, exactly. I think some of the, the third-party ones have pattern matching built into them, but uh, the built-in one, yes. I don't know if there's a pattern matching in Autofac. Any of our Autofac folks know if it's got pattern matching? I think it does. We got a strong maybe on that. <laughs> no one's willing to guarantee it though, huh? All right, uh, let's keep moving here a second. And we can always get some more questions if you uh, all right, so these are the things we talked about. We talked a little about IOC, DI as a way to do IOC. I showed you how the DI framework specifically works in ASP.NET Core with the lifetime, uh, how we configure it from the startup class, and then how you can actually inject stuff into basically all of your entry, point, entry points into your code. Uh, we saw that kind of real world example, counting requests. I guess maybe that's not super real world. Um, and then we looked at a few of the different DI frameworks that are possible uh, use also. So, I promised I would show this slide again. If you want to get the code or slides for this, you can do that from the GitHub. And I think we've got, we've got about five minutes left, so I can definitely address more questions. Has any more? Yes, in the back. Uh, oh, does it allow you to inject somewhere besides the constructor? Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so you can inject other places, but you need to actually create um, 
blanking on the name of the container class right now, but you have to basically inject the container class into your class, and you can use that to create instant services. There's nothing, uh, I know some of the other third party ones have like uh, attributes you can mark up properties with, and then it'll inject into your property for you. It doesn't have anything like that. It's very vanilla, very basic, um, but it does all the kind of basic things. Other questions? All right, great. Well, thanks for coming. I appreciate your time.